Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Elise Traub. I'm the Senior Director of External Affairs at Best Friends Animal Society. And we are so excited to announce our partnership with AARP Texas, um, focused on combating isolation and helping uh, homeless pets find loving homes with people in Texas. So we're so excited for the content of our webinar today. And just a quick housekeeping note before we get started, if you hover your mouse over the bottom of the screen, uh, you will see an option um, that says Q&A. And we actually are lucky enough today to have three uh, dog and cat experts on the call with us, and they are gonna be answering your questions live. So if you have a dog or cat or even another kind of animal and you have any questions for them, you can put those right in the Q&A. Feel free to type those questions in now. We will be watching those. We are also streaming this live on Facebook. So if you are watching on Facebook and you have a question, feel free to put it in the comment box there as well. We are monitoring that and we will try to get to all of your questions live today. Um, and with that, I am so excited to introduce Rosalinda Martinez, who is the Associate State Director of Outreach and Advocacy for AARP Texas. Welcome. Thank you, Elise. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, my name is Rosalinda Martinez and I'm the Associate State Director of Outreach and Advocacy here in Houston. Um, did you know that isolation and loneliness can lead to health issues like heart attacks, stroke, type two diabetes, cognitive decline and premature deaths for older adults and their caregivers, or that social isolation and loneliness can become more common with age. Since the pandemic, the number of people looking for companionship and to make a human connection has increased. That is why AARP in Houston and Best Friends Animal Society are partnering, intending to ease loneliness and bring comfort during these stressful times by pairing Houstonians with adoptable Houston pets. We call our program Beat Loneliness in the Lone Star State. The campaign features free webinars like the one today. Participants will also receive a special 50% discount code to adopt a pet through Houston's Best Friends Adoption Program. Find out more and register for our webinar on March 19 and to receive the discount code to adopt a pet at bestfriends.org forward slash act now. That's bestfriends.org forward slash act now. Now for isolation resources, you can visit my.connect to effect.org. I hope you enjoy the program we have for you today. I'm now gonna pass it on to Carrie McKeel, State Communication Strategist for Best Friends Animal Society. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Rosalinda. Before we get started, I just wanted to share with you a little info about Best Friends and our mission. Best Friends Animal Society is a leading national animal welfare organization dedicated to ending the killing of dogs and cats in every community and every shelter across America by 2025. In addition to running life-saving programs in partnership with nearly 3,000 animal welfare groups across the country, we have life-saving centers in New York City, Los Angeles, and Salt Lake City, as well as programming in Atlanta and Houston. We also operate the nation's largest no-kill sanctuary for companion animals in Kanab, Utah. Since 1984, Best Friends has really been a pioneer in the no-kill movement and has helped reduce the number of healthy, adoptable animals killed in shelters nationwide from an estimated 17 million per year to around about 733,000. To track progress, we actually have a pet life-saving dashboard you can find on our website. It's at www.bestfriends.org 2025. The dashboard contains a country map and color codes each state based on life-saving data from shelters located within that state. Uh, with dark green illustrating a no-kill state, and you will see Delaware is the only state so far to achieve that success, to a red color code illustrating that state is killing over 95,000 animals. And as you will see, Texas is red and ranked number two in highest shelter deaths behind California. When you hover, hover over the state of Texas, you can learn more about the life-saving gap and even drill down to see the data in your local community and local shelters. 
Shelters receive no-kill designation when they are not killing for space and they are saving at least 90% of healthy adoptable animals. While in Texas, although there are currently 142 no-kill animal shelters, there still remains a significant life-saving gap. Nearly 97,000 healthy and adoptable cats and dogs were killed last year in the state of Texas simply because they did not have a safe place to call home. So as we inch forward to our 2025 goal of ending the killing of cats and dogs in every shelter, in every community, we've ramped up a programming in the states that need support the most, like Texas. Houston is the hub of our life-saving efforts in Texas. We have staff and strong network of volunteers that work day in and day out on programming designed to narrow the life-saving gap in our state and collaborate with municipal shelters on best practices for achieving life-saving outcomes. If you want to do more to help animals in your own community here in Houston, we invite you to be part of our Texas team. As we strive forward um, <clears throat> towards our mission, we always welcome the opportunity to link arms with folks willing to temporarily open their home to shelter pet through our foster program, open their business, warehouse, garden center to a working cat or cats, volunteer their time to assist with the transport, processing adoptions, repping at a community outreach event, or helping to return community cats to their neighborhoods. You can learn more about how to get involved here in Houston at bestfriends.org backslash Houston. By working together, we will save them all. And again, thank you for joining us. And now I'm going to turn things over to Elise to introduce our guest panelists for today. Thank you so much, Carrie. Uh, it's great to be here. And I think I'm going to start with our questions and have each um, of our experts just introduce themselves quickly when they answer their first question. So we had a question submitted in advance that I'm going to turn over to Michelle Logan and she can start tell us a little bit about herself and her expertise with animals and then answer um, our question. But this person has a Basenji breed dog and um, is dealing with what we call leash reactivity. So the dog, when they're out on walks and they see another dog is barking and trying to go after that dog and getting upset. And these are dogs that are, are friendly. And this is something we hear pretty frequently. And I'm sure there's other um, folks who are joining the webinar today who may have dealt with this with their dogs. So Logan, I will turn it over to you for your advice on how to handle that. Sure, thanks Elise. And just to introduce myself, my name is Michelle Logan. I am the director of our National Shelter Embed Program and currently also serving as the interim director of Dogtown here at the sanctuary in Kanab, Utah. Uh, I've been with Best Friends about 15 years. Um, I do have a bachelor's of science in animal science and technology and um, have a lot of experience, a lot of varied experience working with dogs. Um, in regard to that particular question, um, we see this a lot, right? And sometimes it is um, leash reactivity. Sometimes it's also a frustration on the end of the dog, right? The, the dog, if dog friendly, um, we generally recommend allowing that dog some time to play with other dogs um, to get that energy out. And then they're not so excited when they see other dogs because, you know, they're sometimes at the end of the leash, like, I want to go play with my friends, you know, and we're not allowing them to do that. Um, but ultimately, too, one of the best things if the dog is treat motivated is, you know, um, and depending on the size of the dog and the diet and all of that, right, but you want to take a lot of really small treats with you on the walk, and you want to catch that before the dog starts reacting. So, um, you know, I have George in my office, so I'll use him for an example, but if I was out walking George and I know he's reactive to other dogs, from when I see another dog, I want to get George to pay attention to me and do something that I'm asking him. So basically, if I see another dog, I would say, George, and he would look up at me and I would give him a treat. And we continue to do that to a point where as I'm walking George in the future, he'll see another dog and then he'll look up at me and he'll be looking to me for that direction and guidance on how he should be reacting. So, um, you know, generally speaking, that's the, the best way is to really work on building your bond and having the dog look to you for how to react instead of choosing for themselves how to react, which is generally what people don't like when they're at the end of the leash lunging and barking. Great. Thank you, Logan. That is very helpful. Um, now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to move to a cat question. This is one that was just asked live. Um, about litter box use. And this person has a cat that's 10 years old and has not been using the litter box. So I'm gonna turn that over to Samantha Bell, um, our cat expert to answer that question. 
Hello, everyone. I'm Samantha Bell, and I've been working with cats for over 20 years. I spent the last seven years as the cat behavior lead for Best Friends in Los Angeles, where I provided love and care to tens of thousands of cats. I, I've given presentations on cat behavior at CatCon, Cat Camp, Feline Behavior Symposiums, Best Friends National Conferences. I also have my own private cat behavior consulting business. And I'm a national trainer mentor for this program where I work with shelters and rescues all over the country. And I teach them how to help their cats through clicker training, how to get adopted and how to help their behavior problems. So when it comes to cats, I've seen just about everything and, and hope to be able to answer just about any question you throw out at me. Litter box is such a common, common problem with cats, unfortunately. And um, it's one that's gross and stinky and we definitely want to get that solved. That's Johan, that's my, that's my buddy over here. Um, so if the cat is 10 years old, there is a chance like around 10, they start showing some senior type medical issues. Like maybe they might have a little bit of arthritis where it does hurt just a little bit to step over that big tall lip into the box. So you might want to consider a lower entry box for the cat. If the cat has not gotten a full workup at the vet lately, I would suggest to do that first. That's always, when cats stop using the litter box, they're telling us something is wrong with me or something is wrong with the box. That's their way of communicating to us. And 82% of the time, I believe, litter box issues are due to medical reasons. So you wanna take the cat to the vet and not just look at them, but also get a full blood workup. I had a cat that stopped using the litter box and we couldn't figure out why she looked great. She was 10 and um, it was diabetes. And turns out she was just trying to tell me there's something weird in my body that's going on and I don't understand it. So I'm gonna go outside the litter box to let you know there's an issue. Um, so many times it's medical, but also it just could be they don't like something about the box. They love open boxes. They don't want it covered. They want it out in a nice place that's not hidden away in a dark corner. They really care about the position of the box and that it's open and big. And if your cat is going on fabric all the time, maybe they're, they're going on clothes, take some old towel or something and put it in the litter box. If they're enjoying going on a certain, you know, type of fabric, put it in there. Or if it's, you know, just different carpet, put carpet in the litter box. So just try it. You have to be a detective when it comes to litter box, but luckily our vets are there to help us solve most of those problems. Thank you so much, Samantha. That was so helpful. And I will say uh, to your first point about a bigger litter box, I actually had a cat that I was fostering that was having this challenge too. And I got some really good advice that some of the commercially available litter boxes are actually quite small, especially if you have a big cat. So there's different kinds of things you can use like storage boxes, those under the bed boxes that can actually make a, for a bigger litter box. And some cats are much better about using their box when it's just bigger for them. Yeah. So. Ideally, you want the box to be a length, the length of the cat plus half the length of the cat. So one and a half cats long and litter boxes don't come that big. So those clear plastic containers and just cut a very low scoop in it so they can get in is, is a great idea. Thanks, Elise. Yeah, thank you. And um, I'm going to direct our third question to Tierney Sane, one of our other um, dog experts. And this is a question that we got um, in advance about um, our, this particular dog has separation anxiety. Um, and they're, the person's getting some complaints from neighbors that when they're not home, their dog is barking. So would love your advice, Tierney, on how we can help dogs who have separation anxiety or might be barking a lot when people are, are not at the house. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, my name is Tierney Sane, and I have been involved with Best Friends for about eight years now. I'm currently a dog supervisor here in Dogtown, which is the dog department of our sanctuary in Utah. And I have about eight, uh, 15 years experience working with a lot of challenging dogs um, that exhibit some challenging behaviors such as bite histories, etc. Um, there's a lot of things you can do for dogs with separation anxiety and what works for one dog may not work for the next. So you kind of have to individualize um, your plan for your particular dog. The biggest thing is leaving the house and coming home shouldn't be super exciting. It should be a calm um, environment for the dog so the dog doesn't think what's happening is super stressful. 
And it's really important for dogs to have mental stimulation just as much as physical exercise. And you can do things like that when you're not even home. So um, you can use uh, frozen Kongs. So Kongs are just a tool you can buy online or at a pet store. And you can put peanut butter, um, wet food or dry food mixed with wet inside the Kong, put it in your freezer and take it out before you leave um, the house. Give it to your dog and that just keeps them busy for an hour or so just working at that calm trying to get the treats you can do the same thing with food puzzles you can freeze food puzzles in the freezer and give that to the dog before you leave um, there are also different stages of nose work you could do so you can put your dog in one room and hide treats all around the house or in one specific location so that when you leave the house you can let the dog out and they're searching for these treats and staying busy while you leave Another really good tool that a lot of people don't know about is um, essential oils. So you can actually get diffusers online and um, lavender is a really good scent. You can put lavender in the diffuser and kind of let that go when you're leaving and it's supposed to be kind of calming for the dog. Um, and like I said, when you come home, not a big deal. So you wanna make leaving exciting for the dog in the way that they have something to do, um, but not exciting in the, in the fact that you're leaving or you're coming home. Great, thank you so much, Tierney. And as um, Rosalinda mentioned at the beginning of our webinar, um, right now we are offering a 50% discount on adoptions from our AARP, from our Best Friends Houston program um, with, our, with AARP partnerships. So this is for AARP members, their friends and family. And we have a lot of great dogs available um, for adoption on the website, um, but we actually have a few live here. Well, not quite live, but you can see them on video. Um, maybe Data can say hi really quickly um, off mute so you can see her because we do have one puppy um, actually live on the call. Um, yes, hi, I'm Data. I'm with the Houston's team and I am part of the adoptions team. So we would love to help um, match you all with some wonderful puppies, dogs, kittens, cats. Um, they are looking to meet you and again, make the best companions as you can see. It's kind of hard for me not to be smiling as um, he's on camera here, but this is Toro. Can you say hi? I was trying to get his nose in there. Hi. So this is one of the many, many puppies and dogs. And again, we have cats and kittens and you'll get to see some of them here a little bit later in the program, but we would love to help match you um, with a companion animal and help you find your uh, best friend with four paws or three paws, right? Yeah. Say hi, Toro. <laughs> And a reminder, if you do want to see which um, dogs are available, you can go to bestfriends.org slash act now and all the information about our Houston program is right there for you. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Jeff right now to um, show us our first video and this is going to feature a um, adoptable dog or cat. We'll see what we get. Um, but an adoptable pet available again with the discount through our um, Houston program. And this pet is not at a shelter, it's in a foster home. So that's another program that some of you may be interested in if you're not ready to make a commitment to another pet. Um, you can foster one, you can take care of them temporarily. So I will turn it over to Jeff to start our video on this adoptable animal. Hi, my name is Dina. And for the last three years, my family and I have been fosters, volunteers, and transport drivers for Best Friends Houston. We are committed to helping Houston reach no-kill status. In order for that to happen, families like ours need to step up and become fosters. In fostering, not only do you save the life of an animal in need, but you also get lots of exercise and lots of attention, lots of cuddles during the pandemic. <laughs> My foster here is Magnolia, and she is available for adoption through Best Friends Houston. She's three years old, and um, she's a very petite, Lab, lab at 27 pounds <laughs> and she loves to give kisses. So if you're looking for someone to get some fresh air with, lots of exercise and lots of puppy kisses, reach out to your local shelters and foster. Wonderful. Thank you. And a reminder at bestfriends.org slash act now is where you can find more information about adopting that dog or any dog that you see today and there's a lot of other animals available for adoption that we're not even going to get a chance to show you today. So we highly recommend you check it out. 
Um, I am going to, we're going to go back to our experts and ask some more questions. We've got another one that came in live about um, cats fighting. And I think the important, um, two important details on this particular question, the cats are, um, there's three of them and they are all neutered males, um, but they are fighting and it seems to be getting worse. So what is your advice, Samantha? Hi. So um, I have three neutered males too. And when they're fighting, what you want to listen for are um, audio cues to let you know if it's going well, if they're enjoying the fighting or if they're not. If it's relatively quiet, where the three cats are just kind of making little like, mm, 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 those kind of noises, they're actually enjoying that fighting and it is considered enrichment and it's one of the highest forms and best types of enrichment a cat can have is to be able to actually act out those wild hunting instincts on another cat. All cats need to hunt and catch and kill and bite. And if they have each other to do it on, that is ideal. My cats, if, if you didn't know, they look like they're trying to kill each other, but it's actually great enrichment because they need to do that. If there are screams and it sounds, you know, you hear really bad, loud screams. That means they're not happy about it. And one thing you can do is try to fulfill that hunting instinct with them by getting a wand toy, like the long pole with the, the toy on the end and getting that hunting instinct out of their system yourself and get them to hunt and catch and kill something other than their brothers. So you want to do 15 minutes a day of wand toy time with the kitties and you can just do it while you're watching TV or working and uh, and then you can get their wild biting crazy instincts out on something appropriate. That's it. Great advice. Uh -huh. Thank you. And um, I'm going to turn over, we've got another question um, that I'm going to turn over to Logan. But before I do that, I want to remind everyone too, as we've mentioned before, if you're interested in finding any of these dogs, that is at bestfriends.org slash act now. And then as, as we'll also remember, a real focus for this is helping to combat isolation. We know that's been a real challenge, especially during the pandemic. And there's a lot of scientific research that shows how companion animals like cats and dogs can be really helpful in um, combating isolation. So I wanna highlight one website that Rosalinda mentioned at the beginning, which is my.connecttoeffect.org. Um, that's the number two, and um, she'll put it in the chat again so you can see that, but that also has resources on isolation. So I'm going to turn things over to Logan now. We had somebody who asked a question live, I believe, on Facebook, um, and they have a dog, and um, their neighbor has a dog, and they share a fence line, and the dogs are trying to, they're really not liking each other at the fence, trying to kill each other, this person said. So it sounds pretty serious. Um, Logan, what is your advice? Yeah, there's a... Uh a multitude of things you can do for that. And some of it, I think, is depending on how much time, right, the individual wants to spend. Um, one of the best things you can do for your own dog is to work on their recall, right? So that if you let them out and they start this, we call it fence gaming, right? They start doing that and running up and down the fence. When you call them, they come to you. And um, that does take a lot of time to work with them on. Um, some of the other things you can do um, for a quicker result um, there's actually something that we use with our community cat programs that is a humane deterrent um, that you can actually hook. It's a motion activated sprinkler, right? So I have actually personally done this at my house. My dogs were doing the same thing with my neighbor's dogs. And while I was working with my dogs, my neighbor wasn't working with her dogs so well. Um, so I put a motion activated sprinkler on the end of the fence line. So whenever my dogs actually approached that fence line, they would get a squirt of water which they didn't like, which would keep them backed off of that fence line. So they, over time, were conditioned to learn that if they wanted to avoid getting sprayed by that water, that they didn't go along the fence line. There's some other things you can do as well, depending on um, you know, what the, you can put interrupters along the fence line. So a lot of dogs will run, hit the fence, and then they run up and down that fence line. So if you just put like little sections of fence that actually come out, it creates a barrier that they can't run directly up and down that fence line. So that can work. There's also, um, you can get at like a garden supply store, Lava Rock, 
Um, dogs don't generally like the way the lava rock feels under their feet. So you could create like a, a foot or two foot barrier along the fence line of that lava rock. So the dogs will start to avoid going in that area for um, not wanting that on their feet. I will say too, um, as, as with the, the leash issue earlier, um, sometimes it's not necessarily fence fighting. Again, it's frustration. I actually have a friend of mine whose dogs were doing that and um, they worked with a trainer to come over and help do introductions between the dogs. And they wound up actually cutting a hole in the fence and the dogs, when they went out, could go in either yard and they were friends. So some of that was true frustration that they just wanted to interact with each other um, and they safely do that now. So a whole bunch of different options there. Lots of options. Thank you, Logan. That's really helpful. Um, I'm going to give our next question to Tyranny. We had um, somebody who, um, as I mentioned before, fostering is one way you can help out um, homeless pets by bringing them into your home. This person really wants to do more fostering, but they actually already have a resident dog. And they were saying when they foster, their resident dog tends to get jealous and sulky and doesn't really like having a foster dog around. Um, so they're looking for some tips on how they can help that resident dog and um, hopefully be able to foster more animals. Yeah, dogs definitely vary on how much they like other dogs. Some dogs just don't like other dogs and that's just the way it is. But if it's something like a jealousy aspect or a sulking aspect, um, my suggestion would be starting off by everything that's good, they do together. So if you're going to go for a walk, they go for a walk together. If you do training in the house, they do it together. Um, so I would just pair positive things with one another so they really get used to each other and that these good things happen when they're together. And it's definitely going to be a work in progress and you'll have to kind of um, progress one step at a time. But that would be my um, initial suggestion would be just good things happen at the same time. Great. Thank you, Tierney. And if there are folks on this call, whether you have pets at home or you don't, um, and you're interested in fostering, we do have some information um, at the link I mentioned before, bestfriends.org slash act now. Um, and now we're going to take a little break to see another um, adoptable pet through um, Best Friends Houston. So I'll ask Jeff to pull up the video. And while he does that, um, I will note that we, um, we did have a question that came through on Facebook about these adoption options. And somebody was asking, do you have to live in Houston to adopt? And the answer is no. Um, if you go to Best Friends' website, um, you can find information about all of the different places we have pets for adoption. And um, the nice thing is that pretty much every community in America has a local animal shelter um, with pets that are looking for homes. So we have a place on our website where you can look that up too. Um, if you're not local to Houston, but if you are in the Houston area and you want to participate, you don't have to live right in, um, in Houston. That's no problem. So Jeff, you want to roll the video? Hi, my name is Debbie and this is my husband. And we've been fostering or working with best friends since right after Hurricane Harvey when they came to town to help out. We foster animals and we volunteer in other ways when we can. We've been married 35 years. And one of the first things we did as a couple was go to an animal shelter and adopt a puppy and a kitten. And all of our pets since then have been rescues of one sort or another. We started fostering about 10 years ago. Well, we tried to foster. We went to a, a rescue group and we brought home this wonderful dog who's still with us. So our first attempt was a failed foster, but we have had many foster dogs since then. Okay. This is our current foster, Lacey. She's enthused by some dog treats we dropped and she's paying more attention to that than anything else. But we've had her about a month. She's approximately three years old and 50 to 55 pounds. So she's considered a medium sized dog. Yeah, but she is, like I said, we've had her for, for a couple years. She is either a, a Blue Lacey or a Staffordshire mix, depending on who you ask. But she is a very good dog, very smart dog. She is crate trained. She is leash walk trained. She walks well. Uh, she gets along with our dogs and cats. Uh, she really wants to play with our cats, kind of much to the consternation of the cats. They're not quite used to a 50-pound animal lunging at them to play with them. Uh, but she's she's actually she's done 
she's done pretty well. Like I said, she is housebroken. Uh, she seems to be enjoying herself here. So she taught herself to use the outside door and the dog door within a day. And our black cat taught her not to come in the house in about two days through the dog door. So she has a little issue with that right now. But she's doing doing fairly well. Okay, let's see. We again, like I said, she is probably our 10th foster. But when we foster, it gives these guys a chance to be seen. And it gives these guys a chance to have a, a find a forever home. Uh, I think they enjoy just being out of the shelter. Uh, and so if nothing else, she's getting that. And it leaves room in the shelter for another dog. So we're supporting the 2025 no kill in that way. And we're happy to support that goal because we believe in it wholeheartedly any way we can. Great, thanks, Jeff. And um, again, if you want to adopt Lacey, bestfriends.org slash act now. Um, you can see her and any of the other adoptable animals in, in the Houston program. So we're going to get back to one more round of questions before we wrap up today. Um, if you asked a question, we've got a ton of questions coming in. So if you asked one and you didn't get an answer, we will follow up in a Facebook comment. So we'll try to get to everyone. Um, but I'm going to start with a cat question for Samantha. Uh, we got a question about cats scratching furniture and um, what your advice is for helping um, preserve your knife's couch if you have a cat that likes to scratch on it. I love this question because um, a lot of people don't realize that cats have to scratch. There's no way to stop them from scratching. So scratching is an instinctive behavior for cats. Unlike dogs, cats are still quite wild and they still retain a lot of those wild instincts. And one of those instincts is to scratch. And cats that are wild and all of our outdoor cats, what they like to scratch on are trees. And what are trees? Trees, well, not what are trees, but what are the qualities that make a tree worth scratching? Trees are tall, sturdy, and textured. That is what they want. So when you are giving your cat a little tiny scratcher that's like this big, it doesn't have what they need. They need something that is taller than they are because when they scratch, they also are stretching their muscles. So the scratcher needs to be taller than the cat. It needs to not be able to tip over no matter what. So, um, a couch is like that. A couch is tall. A couch isn't going to tip over and it's textured. So just try to think of a tree when you're getting a scratcher. There are some thick, heavy ones that do not tip over. That's what you want. Great. Thank you, Samantha. That is very helpful. I know that's something that a lot of people have cats have questions about. Um, I am um, going to, this is actually a similar question, um, but for dogs, I'm going to give this one to Logan. Um, somebody who uh, is trying to clip their dog's nails, which we all know we need to do for our pups, um, but her dog is very scared and she feels like she's tried anything. So what are your tips for someone who's tried everything and their dog still doesn't like to have those feet touched? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that can be really helpful is starting to help them associate when you're touching their feet. You're not doing anything else. You're not trying to clip them. You're not right. But when you're cuddling with them, when you're just start to touch their feet all the time, you know, make it a positive experience, give them treats when doing that again, um, that sorts to helps build that positive association for them. One of the other things that um, has been really helpful over the years, when you actually get to the point of clipping them, don't do that yet. Take matchsticks, like the old school um, wooden matchsticks that come in those boxes and put that by their paw. And when you're clipping, clip the matchstick to start off with, not their toenails. It starts to help them to associate that sound that's going on with nothing happening to them. And then you can gradually work up to actually clipping their toenails. But that's a really good way to help desensitize them to the having you hold their paw and that sound happening. That is a great tip. I've never heard that before, but I'm sure it's very creative. Um, thank you. So we're gonna take one more question. And again, um, we, um, we're gonna take one more question and then we're gonna show one more adoptable um, pet. And then I know a lot of folks had um, great questions 
Um, and we will follow up in, in the comments if we didn't get to you today. But I'm going to give this one to Tierney. And I'm sure um, other people struggle with this too. But this person has a dog that is very scared anytime there's a thunderstorm or fireworks. Um, they've tried a lot of the things that some people might know about, like the thunder shirt, even CBD, turning on TV to block the noise. Any other suggestions for dogs that are really scared in those scenarios? Yeah, those are um, really good suggestions you already provided, but thunder shirts work for some dogs, not all. Same thing with essential oils. You could also try like lavender or, lavender or a stress relief um, oil. Also giving them a safe place to go to. So that could be a crate. Sometimes crates are really nice. You could even put a blanket over the crate. So it's kind of like their little cubby that they can go to and just kind of hide out. Um, stay there while the fireworks or whatever are going on, and then um, be able to calm down and come out afterward. What I do at home, I actually have a dog, and luckily he's lost a lot of his hearing. Um, he's a senior now, but um, I would just put music on. I'd put the stereo on a little bit louder um, than what the thunderstorm was doing or what the fireworks were doing outside. Um, and then he had no idea it was even happening. So I think it kind of depends on the dog. Um, there are also some calming medications you could consider if it's super severe, um, but I would just um, talk to your vet about that and see if it's something that's worth pursuing. Great. Thanks, Tierney. So I'm going to have Jeff queue up in our next video. We're going to see one more adoptable pet. This is the third one we've seen today, but that does not mean that um, those are the only pets we have for adoption. Bestfriends.org slash act now. That's where more of those adoptable pets are available. So go ahead, Jeff. Hi, my name is Dave. I am with the Best Friends Houston team. I am a foster and volunteer, and this is one of my amazing fosters, Lucas. He is a mini Black Panther. He's around seven months old, a domestic short hair. He is the ultimate lap kitty. If you are looking for a kitty to do this, just hug on you and sit in your lap and give you purrs and kisses all day long. Um, he is definitely the ultimate companion the companion cat. I'll try to get a little uh, close-up of his face here. He's a little mini black panther, just so soft and velvety, purrs constantly 24-7. Hold on, let me see if I can turn him around, sorry. Here's his cute little face, as you can see. He is velvety, he is regal, he has one white whisker on each side of his face, and again, he's so, so incredibly sweet. You could just sit and pet him all day. He's the ultimate mood booster. Um, and right now he's going to go play. He just had breakfast, but that's okay because I wanted to talk to y'all about why I foster and volunteer with Best Friends. And I've also adopted a dog from Best Friends as well. Um, I got to meet my best friends uh, during the foster process. But fostering an animal and a pet in need can be so incredibly rewarding, not only to us as a human, but it can be such a, a vital part and chapter of each animal's life. Um, we're able to help a cat like Lucas to be in a loving environment. They get to be in a home, a home setting where they're going to ultimately be when they're matched with a wonderful family. Um, and they get to learn to really be the best cat and kitty that they can be. So Lucas, again, is around seven months old. Um, we have a couple other cats here at my house that help him and guide him to trust people and to be the sweet and best, most cuddly kitten he can be. I'll see if I can get him to come over here again. Um, but yes, fostering also can be such an amazing mood booster, especially now more than ever. Everyone is home a lot more than we were. And during Zoom meetings, during work meetings, if I've had a long day, I can just sit down. Lucas will come and jump in my lap and we can watch a movie. We can decompress together. Again, ultimate mood booster, just giving them all the pets and love in the world. And it can be a fun family project too. Um, you can get everybody involved. It's a great teaching moment. My mom is in her mid seventies and we foster neonates and I'll even have my mom help bottle feed the babies. They require 24 hour care. So it's all hands on deck, but we definitely have all types of pets in need that are looking for wonderful foster homes or forever homes um, with you. So if you'd like to know more, please reach out to our Houston team. And we hope that we're able to share all the love, purrs, and sloppy kisses with you in the future. Great. And a reminder, if you want to adopt that miniature panther, you can do that at bestfriends.org slash act now. 
Um, if you had any questions about any of the animals, um, we gave you the website. You can also email Houston Adoption at bestfriends.org. We'll put that in the chat too. Um, but we are coming to our close today. So I'd like to turn it back over to Rosalinda to um, finish, finish this out. Thank you, Elise. That was such great information. Thank you for everyone who joined us. Thank you to the trainers. Thank you to Best Friends Animal Society. I want to remind you all to go to bestfriends.org forward slash act now to learn more and register for the webinar on March 19th to learn how to help pets in your community. Once registered, AARP members, family, friends, and guests will also receive a 50% discount to adopt a pet through the Best Friends Houston Adoption Program. All pets adopted through Best Friends Animal Society are vaccinated, spayed, and neutered, or neutered, and have a microchip. Together, let's beat loneliness in the Lone Star State by adopting or fostering a furry friend. The promotion ends March 31st. Now, for information and resources on fighting isolation, again, you can visit my.connect to the number two, effect.org, or visit aarp.org forward slash Houston for upcoming virtual events in your community to stay connected. On behalf of AARP Houston and Best Friends Animal Society, we urge you to get involved with Best Friends today. So much, Rosalinda. Thanks everyone for joining us. Have a great day.